Hello, good evening, everybody, and um, you're very welcome to our webinar this evening, which uh, relates to junior cycle ordinary level maths, problem solving at junior cycle ordinary level, linking skills, strategies and exam focus. My name is Connor Walker and I work with the publishing team in Folans in the post primary division. And very shortly, I'll hand you over to Mike and to Jim, who will be presenting this evening. Just a little bit of housekeeping. We will have a Q&A at the end of this webinar. So for anyone who'd like to ask any questions, please feel free to fire them into the chat. You should, you should see a, a chat icon at the top of your screen. So if you just put your questions to Mike and to Jim, uh, we'll get through as many of them as we possibly can at the end of the webinar. Um, also, this is being recorded, so we'll make the video available and also um, the slide deck available to anyone who's interested, um, I think on the folands.ie website. So that will be sorted for anyone who wants to, to take a closer look at the webinar or at the slides. Um, so I think that that's it more or less for me. I'm going to hand you over first to Mike and then after that, Jim will present. Um, and just by way of introduction, Mike Keating teaches at Colossus and Escalia in um, County Kerry, and he's an experienced examiner and in-service trainer. And he is one of the authors of our Ma Active Math series for Junior Cycle and for Leaving Certificate. And Jim McElroy has two de decades experience working as a maths teacher um, and also qualified to think in economics maths, applied maths and theoretical physics, so a very experienced member of our special advisor team for active maths as well. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to Mike and I'll be back later for the Q&A. Best of luck, Mike. Perfect. Thank you, Connor, and uh, welcome everybody and uh, thanks for attending tonight. Now, I hope, certainly hope that you're going to get something out of, out of this um, webinar. So as Connor said, basically what Jim and myself are doing, we're just presenting a few problems and we will outline what the problems are about and we will look at the skills that the students need to solve the problems and pick out various parts of the book where those skills are dealt, are dealt with. So we'll just kick off with the first slide here, which is a nice graphic from uh, the PDST side, uh, which takes us through the whole problem solving process. And as you can see there on, on the screen, there are three sections as such to the problem solving uh, process and getting started being the first one. And so the getting started section is where the student um, is doing his or her best to try to uh, understand the problem and what is required. So there are a number of strategies that they can use to help understand the problem. So drawing a diagram or a picture, for example, is one strategy using equipment, so what we mean by equipment is geometry sets and maybe constructing paper models or you know using a bit of software like Desmos or GeoGebra, any of those things uh, to help understand and uh, break the problem down then into simpler parts or solve a simpler version of the problem. Now the second part of problem solving of course is working on the problem where you're trying to find a solution and there are a number of strategies here as well that uh, can be used so, for example, looking for uh, a pattern uh, in the data that you've given, um, making out a table or a chart, and we'll see that in some of the problems later on. Uh, trial and improvement, which is uh, an accepted way of, of, of solving problems as well. But I suppose the important thing here is to know that you need to, if you do use trial and improvement, that you need to verify uh, your solution. And then working backwards, working backwards from uh, the answer. And finally, then where we're uh, digging deeper. So once we have solved our problem, we will try to to generalize it or maybe even prove some results from it. Now at junior start ordinary level, uh, really I suppose generalizing is about the only thing we will do. We won't actually be proving any major results at that stage. OK, now the second slide is also from the PDSD site. You may have seen this one uh, before. But I suppose it's all about the atmosphere that we create in the classroom uh, and we need to create an atmosphere that is uh, conducive to uh, problem solving. So if we are going to set a problem for the students, I suppose the number one priority is that they know the skills that are uh, required to solve the problem. So there's no point uh, in uh, asking them or setting a problem, say, for example, in trigonometry. Trigonometry hasn't been covered at this stage. Okay. 
Now, at the bottom of that slide, there's some important thing as well. Uh, it states that whatever the groups that you divide your students up into, that they share that knowledge with the whole group, um, that mistakes, if they do make mistakes, and everybody mis makes mistakes, that's how you get good at mathematics, that all those mistakes are, are valued. And the third one there, which I think is hugely important, the struggle is productive. So no matter what level you're doing mathematics at, you are going to struggle at it. If you're not struggling at it, then you're probably uh, at the wrong level. So struggle is uh, productive and also it's going to be beneficial in improving your, your mathematics. So that's that's enough of that. We we'll just move on now to the first problem. And <clears throat> again, this is a, a very simple problem that's based on a graphic. We have a group of people here who are queuing for lunch. And Aoife is one of those people. And Aoife is in the middle of the queue. OK, now there is a lot of mathematics that we can generate around this simple graphic. So, for example, we'll see we we'll see later on that um, the student will need to draw on many skills. So they'll need to know about linear patterns, a little bit about functions and graphs. And also we're going to set a few questions based on this on statistics as well. So they'll need to know about measures of center and measures of uh, spread. Now you can see here that we started off with some very easy questions, and I think that is hugely important, particularly nowadays when uh, there is no longer a foundation and all foundation and early level students are working together. So we need to make sure that we're engaging everybody. So it's always good practice to start off with some quite easy questions. So the first question there just asks us what color wristband is EFA wearing? So that's just to ensure that the students can pick out EFA and EFA is in the middle of uh, the group. Then just a simple question, how many people are in the group? How many people are in front of EFA and how many people are behind EFA? OK, so that's again straightforward. And then and question now that stretches them a little bit. Is it possible for Aoife to be right in the middle if there are 20 people, including Aoife, in the queue? So again, that should generate a bit of uh, a bit of discussion. And of course, they will should come upon the answer then that if it's an even number, then that Aoife cannot possibly be in the middle. There must be the same number in front of her as there is behind her and then add her into the group as well. OK, now <clears throat> there's more obviously more to the problem, but before we go on to the rest of it, just to look at the kind of skills that they will need to continue on. So there's going to be a bit of statistics at the end of it. So they're going to need to know how to find the median. They will need to know how to find the mean and they'll need to know how to find the range of a set of numerical data. And I've just taken a few questions there out of the new textbook um, that kind of will consolidate those uh, skills. Um, now, the fourth thing then that they need to know about are graphs of uh, linear functions. Now we have, a, a, this is taken from uh, the textbook as well. We have a graph here. I suppose if you were at Leaving Cert level, you call it a piecewise function, but it's two linear functions, uh, pretty much two linear functions stuck together, so to speak. And um, so what they need to be able to do to solve this problem is they need to know how to find the slope. They need to know how to graph linear functions. Um, and they need to know how to construct a linear function from some data that we give them. So they're the basic skills required for this particular problem. On we go. Now we're stretching them a little bit. Um, we're asking them to complete this table. So uh, you probably have them divided up into groups at, at this stage. And um, you see this table here. We've got the number of people in front of EFA. So uh, it's varying from one to six. And then if there is one person in front of Aoife, and remember Aoife is in the middle, how many people are in the queue? And we have given them the answer to the first one. That's three, one in front, one behind, and Aoife herself. And then they fill up that table. OK, now part G then uh, is an extension of that. They're not relying on the table. We're just asking if there are 20 people in front of Aoife, how many people are in the queue? And if there are 20 people in front, of course, they're going to say there's 20 people behind. If she's in the middle, 20 and 20 is 40, plus one is 50. Now, that may seem simple, but, uh, you know, for a weak foundation level student, uh, there's a bit of work in that and they will struggle a little, a little bit with it. Part H then is where we start to move on to generalizing this thing a little bit. So if there are n people in front of Aoife, write an expression in n for the total number of people in uh, the group. And again, this question should generate 
quite a bit uh, of discussion. So N people in front, if you're hoping that they're going to say she's in the middle, there's going to be N people behind. And now they're going to have to uh, know a little bit of algebra if they want to find out the number in the queue, because they're going to have to add N and N, and then add E fin to it as well. Um, so again, there, there are a few other questions that you can ask them uh, to actually get to that uh, answer. Um, so now there are other aspects of it as well that we could examine at this stage. Now I haven't written any other questions, but you could, um, for example, say if there were twice as many in front of Eve as there were behind her, and there was n people behind her, uh, how many people are in the group? So like you'd have two n plus n plus one. So you could extend that. Um, you could also, for example, ask say if there's two n in front and there's n behind her and there are 49 people altogether in the queue, what's the value for n? So you're really pushing them at that stage um, when you go to that, uh, that level of question. That's a more, more higher order thinking. Okay, but as you can see, there's quite an, a lot of mathematics that we can we can uh, glean from just this simple graphic. Now we're still not finished because we're hoping now at this stage that they have figured out that there are two n plus one people in the group if there are n in front and n behind. Okay, so we now have this function q of n equals two n plus one, where q of n is the number of people in the queue and n is the number of people in front of Efa. So now we can ask them to do a bit of graphing at this stage. Uh, we would give them the axes, okay? Now I, I have the whole uh, the whole graph here, uh, but you you could give them the axes where we have uh, the number of people in front of Efa on the horizontal axis and the total number of people in the queue vertical axis and ask them to to draw the uh, the graph of that linear function. Okay, and of course you can get uh, a lot more out of the graph now that they have uh, drawn it. So for example, we could ask them to write down the slope of that line, a bit of coordinate geometry here, right down the slope of the line. And what does the slope of the line mean in the context of this question? Now, that's a, that's a difficult question, but it's a question that has been asked uh, pretty recently in the junior set ordinary level um, exam. So I think the slope works out uh, to be two. And then, of course, uh, it's the rate at which uh, Q changes with respect to T are in simple language. For every one person added to the front of the Q, the Q increases by two. So that would be the explanation of what the slope is. On we go, and we still have more uh, to get out of this. Um, we're picking the five people now at the back of the queue. So we've Ava, Tom, Bob, Jim, and Tim. And uh, the five people at the back of the queue are standing in order of their heights. Okay? And the median height for the group is 172 centimeters. The difference between Tim's height and Ava's height is 11 centimetres, Ava is 164 centimetres in height, Tom is six centimetres taller than Ava, and the mean height for the group is 171 centimetres. Now there's a lot of information being being thrown at them there, so here's where they really need to break it down into smaller chunks, and Ava's height is given as 164, and then of course Tom is six centimetres taller, so that makes Tom 170. The one that they might have difficulty with if they don't understand the median is that Bob is the median height, which is 172. And of course, Tim then is 11 centimetres taller than uh, Eva, and I think that makes him 175. And then the more difficult part of it then is finding Jim's height, um, and we're using the mean height of the group for that. So the mean height is 171, so there are five people in the group, so the sum of the heights is going to be, uh, what is it, 855, I think. And um, from that, then you can add up the other people's heights and subtract it away from 855, and that will give you Jim's height. Okay, <clears throat> now there's quite, a, I, I've gone through uh, pretty quickly there, but there's quite a lot, and I'm sure that would take up the most of a class, that, that, that problem on its own. Okay, now there are some exam-related questions here that uh, we're going to put up with each problem. So here's one from a few years back. Following numbers of a median of six in a range of nine, they're given an increasing R to find the value of X and the value of uh, Y. Now, it's not in a real life context, but it's pretty much what we've been doing. Part B then is a small bit more difficult. Following six numbers of a median of 15, mean of 18 in a range of 30, they're given an increasing R to find the value of A, B and C. So that's kind of like the problem that we have just solved. 
So that's our um, that's our first uh, problem. So on we go. Second problem now. This one is on um, consecutive uh, integers. And um, so just a few easy questions again to to kick the thing off. Um, so um, what are consecutive integers? So they have to have some knowledge of what, a con what consecutive integers are. Then another quite easy one, list four positive consecutive integers. So that should be uh, straightforward enough. They'll probably give one, two, three, and four. And list four negative consecutive integers, okay? And I suppose I should have put in there uh, in order of magnitude or in increasing order so that, you know, they'll start at the smallest. They, they could go minus eight, minus seven, minus six, minus five, that kind of thing. Now, here is uh, the next part, which we are going to generalize later on. We have four consecutive integers. They're shown in the number line uh, below. So you have 12, 13, 14 and uh, 15. And we want to find the difference between the product of the two outer numbers and the two inner numbers, the two middle numbers. OK, so again, here is a bit of terminology that they have to be familiar with there. And again, this is a word that they never seem to latch on to grasp the product. Uh, you have to tell them all the time. The product means it's two numbers multiplied uh, together. So calculate the product of 12 by 15 and calculate the product of 13 by 14 and subtract one from the other. And when they do that, they should get an answer of uh, two. OK. Now, where is this leading to? First of all, let's look at the skills that they, they will need. So first of all, I have just some knowledge of consecutive integers. And here's the question again from the book. Uh, Claude says that the sum of two consecutive numbers is 35. Anna says that the numbers are 20 and 15. Lauren says that they are 17 and 18. Who is correct and give a reason uh, for your answer? And then they need a, a multiplication of integers. Of course, that's covered pretty early on. And here we have a worked example from the textbook as well. Evaluate each of those. 6 minus 6 by minus 12 and minus 5 by minus 11. They need to be able to subtract integers. And here again is a worked example from the textbook where we use the number line to uh, subtract. So 5 subtract 7. They'll need to know uh, a bit of algebra here, uh, expanding brackets and simplifying. So multiplying out x plus 1 by x plus 7 is an example, and x plus 3 by x minus 2. And then we're going to extend this problem to a geometry setting. Uh, so they need to know how to find the area of a rectangle. So they're the skills that are required for this particular problem on consecutive uh, integers. OK, so we start here with a table and on the table we have six rows um, and yeah, six rows. We have uh, four rows of consecutive positive integers and we have two rows of consecutive negative integers. And what we're asking them to do uh, is to multiply the two outer numbers and the two inner numbers and to write down the difference in the third column. So for the first one, for example, we have 3 by 6, 18 and 4 by 5 is 20 and the difference uh, between them is uh, 2. Now, I suppose I should really have written in there B multiplied by C minus A multiplied by D rather than uh, difference. Uh, now, they could give minus two. That's fine. That's acceptable as well. But we, we have to ensure that you do the minus two all the way down through the thing. Uh, and so on for the rest of the table. So they should have little difficulty uh, with a calculator um, filling out the rest of that table. Now, the question is, what do you notice? Well, everyone is going to notice this, that the difference is two in all instances. So if you take four consecutive integers, multiply the two outer and multiply the two inner and subtract the results, you will always get a difference of two. And then, of course, the question we can ask then is, do you think this is always true for co four uh, consecutive uh, numbers? And of course, they are going to uh, say yes. Um, they always say yes to those things. But uh, of course, we have to try to generalize this and to show that it will work in all uh, cases. Just giving a few finite examples is not um, uh, is not good enough, or you can make a valid statement just from that amount of evidence that's given there. OK, so we move on to where we generalize. Now, this 
maybe is a little tricky, but they certainly manage the first two. Uh, so we're taking n to be any integer, n to be any integer. And um, we're asking them, first of all, and this is a lead on to generalize this whole idea, list two consecutive integers that begin with n. Two consecutive integers that begin with n. So maybe in this instance, you might have, particularly for the people at the, the at the weaker end of the spectrum, that they may need a little bit of um, a little bit of prompting here for this one. So at least two consecutive integers that begin uh, with n. So we have n and n plus one. The second one lists four consecutive integers that begin with n. So n, n plus one, n plus two, uh, n plus three. And now uh, stretching them a little bit, list two consecutive integers that end with n. All right, so this is a little trickier. They're subtracting, so you're going to have n minus one and n, and then list four consecutive integers that end with n. So we have n minus three, n minus two, n minus one, and n. So they should now at this stage know how to generally, um, in terms of uh, some variable n, uh, write down four consecutive integers. Okay, so now let's move on to generalizing the result that we had earlier on. So here we have our um, we have yeah, our four consecutive integers on a, a number line, n, n plus one, n plus two, and n plus three. And if you can remember from earlier, we found the product of the two outer numbers and the product of the two inner numbers, and we subtracted the product of the outer numbers from the product of the uh, inner numbers. So again, now this is giving them a chance to practice uh, a bit of algebra. So we have n, n plus one, n plus two, and n plus three, four consecutive integers. Find in terms of n the product of the two outer numbers. So, in other words, multiply n by n plus three. Um, so that, if they have that algebra section done, that shouldn't be too bad. Find in terms of n the product of the middle numbers n plus one and n plus two. In other words, multiply n plus one by n plus two. Okay, and then find the difference between one and two. So that'll be a little trickier to find the difference between one and two. Remember in part one, they have got n squared plus 3n, and in part two, they have got n squared plus 3n plus 2, and then they're to take away uh, the outer product from the inner product, and they, as you can see, they will get 2 as their answer. And then what is your answer from part uh, 3 tell you? And of course, it tells us that uh, in general, if we have four consecutive integers, and we take the product of the two outer ones and the product of the two inner ones and subtract one answer from the other, we will always get two. Yeah. Now, and there's an application of uh, this. So here's a, an application. And um, maybe if you want to ponder this one yourself just for a minute or two, uh, or not for a minute or two, for 30 seconds. And if you want to, uh, in your own time, just write down your answer. Uh, we have, uh, without using a calculator, so it's, this is obviously, this is no problem if they use a calculator, but without using a calculator, write down the difference in areas between the following pairs of uh, rectangles and explain your answer. Now the explain is the, I suppose, the important, uh, the important thing there. Um, so further explanation, I mean, they could, they could say here we have four consecutive uh, integers, uh, 101, 102, 103, and 104. And the out if, if we're appealing back to what we have already proved, uh, the outer two are 101 and 104, and the inner two are 102 and 103. And we know that if we multiply 101 by 104 and 102 by 103 and subtract, we'll always get an answer of two. Now it's I think it's very, very useful to get them to actually verbalize it, to write that down. Um, and it is something that is really causing students problems right up to leaving cert level. Uh, it's something that has been appearing for the last number of years in the papers, asking them to uh, asking the student to explain their answer. Uh, and it's, it's really a place where they, where they, they fall down. Uh, I think it was last year, wasn't it, that students were asked to explain at leaving cert higher level. Uh, what was the present value of a thousand euro or something? A uh, uh, thousand euro in years time. What's its present value now? And they had dif real difficulty trying to verbalize, even though they had no problem calculating uh, present value. 
writing it down in a couple of sentences and explaining it was a, a real issue. And then number two, which is probably a little bit more difficult because we're missing one of the rectangles, write down the dimensions of a rectangle with area of two centimeters less than the rectangle shown in the diagram above. OK, so we know that the difference in the area between the two has to be um, two centimeters. And of course, you you sh they, are, they should be able to see then that we, we're talking about four consecutive integers. Again, we have the two inner ones, the 52 and the 53. Now, if we have a rectangle where the two outer integer uh, outer integers, yes, are the length and width of the rectangle, then the difference between the two will be uh, two. So the outer ones in, in this case, of course, would be 51 and 54. So if we take the rectangle that measures 51 by 54, uh, then that will be two centimeters, two centimeters squared less than the 52. No, sorry, that's wrong way around. The 52 by 53 would be greater than the 51 by uh, 54. Okay, so there's again quite a lot to get out of that uh, simple idea with four consecutive uh, integers. Now, just to move on to uh, some exam related uh, questions. Well, there are going to be many exam related questions where we take um, where we take e either a sentence or uh, some numbers and we try to generalize. Um, in other words, use algebra to to, to transform those uh, mathematical sentences into a bit of algebra. So this is one again from a couple of years back. Marcel has a number trick where he asks the audience to think of a number. He calls the number X. Marcel gives the audience the instructions in the table below and then magically tells them what answer they got. And here again, with their given, think of a number as X and then multiply it by three, three X add two, three X plus two and so on, subtract the original number and then divide by two and they give the answer to that and then uh, subtract your original number, your X. So again, just an example of where they're given some sentence and they're asked to transform it into algebra. And you have a similar thing then for the next part there. John is three times as old as Mary. Uh, Mary's age in years is represented by uh, X. Select one expression from A, B, C, D and E, which represents John's age in years. Um, OK, and then they're given the table of values and the algebraic expressions are given and they just select the correct expression from it. But I think if, if you have um, problems that are based, real life problems uh, and transform those into algebra, that uh, really helps and aids them in their understanding of algebra, which is obviously a difficult enough area at junior circle level. Now, I'm finished now, I think, and uh, I'll be handing you over to to Jim. So thank you very much for, for your um, attention. And Jim, I'll stop sharing here, Jim, so that you can. Uh, so. That's great, Mike. Thanks very oh, yeah, much. I'm out of it now. And uh, Mike, can you can you see my screen there? It's coming through. Okay, I can see your screen, Jim. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. So good evening, everybody. And as Mike said, thanks so much for coming along this evening. And I hope that uh, as we work through some problems that we think might be useful at junior cycle ordinary level, you um, will be able to take away something that will be useful for yourself and colleagues and students in your in your schools. I'm going to look at two problems uh, today, just like Mike did, um, and the is called Guess the Olympic Event. And it's a modified version of a problem that I found on the Enric site that's um, moderated by the University of Cambridge. So if you're not familiar, um, enrich.org is the web address. Um, there are hundreds of uh, problems and rich learning experiences in maths across a whole variety of topics from primary up to uh, the latter stages of post-primary, even to third level. Um, suitable for a wide variety of levels and ages. And this is a problem that I picked out for this evening's webinar that I think will be um, useful in the junior cycle ordinary level context. So uh, to explain the problem, uh, first of all, students are presented with a variety of graphs and the graphs show how different Olympic records have changed so the main task that students have to complete is to figure out um, 
what Olympic record or what change in a particular Olympic record do they see in a particular graph? And then some follow on questions um, that the teacher can provide to make for a, a richer experience for the students could be around um, uh, questions like, you know, is it possible to calculate percentage changes in in these records over time? Um, if it's a, a an event uh, that is a running event where the record is a time record, is it possible for students to convert a record time in that running event to what the average speed over that event distance would be? And extending even further, are students able to use some of the skills that they would have um, been developing in junior cycle ordinary level classrooms to be able to predict out into the future to see, for example, you know, what a particular Olympic record might look like, you know, uh, 60 or 70 years from now. So the uh, problem that I have modified is a problem involving these four graphs here. So each of these uh, diagrams, um, each of these graphs shows how a particular Olympic record has changed over the course of the last um, uh, 100 or more years. So since the, uh, I think, 1896, the first modern Olympic Games, Rio uh, Olympics in 2016, and they're all summer Olympic events. So uh, anytime you see a blue dot, that means that a new Olympic record in that particular event has been recorded. So um, what are the skills that the students at junior cycle library level might need to have a knowledge of going into this uh, problem? And, you know, what skills would they be further developing by engaging in this problem? So one, I suppose, obvious skill that they that they would be making use of would be being able to interpret graphical representations of data. And you can see there a worked example from the upcoming edition of Active Maths 1, where uh, students are presented with a trend graph which they have to uh, interpret. Um, another important skill that students would be needing in this particular task definitely would be able to identify correct units of measurement for the axes and also to be able to convert between uh, one unit of measurement and another. And we see here an excerpt again from uh, an upcoming chapter in Active Maths 1 where we have some graded exercise questions that uh, tackle and help students consolidate this skill. Uh, another possible skill for a question that maybe was extended to, you know, can you convert a record time in this distance event to, uh, in this running event, for example, to uh, an average speed, would be the ability to use the uh, distance speed time triangle to calculate average speed given certain data. And we have an excerpt there from uh, a chapter in the new book with some text that would help students um, reflect on this skill or being able to calculate percentage changes um, is another obvious skill that could be tied in with this problem. And there are some other skills then as well that might help students uh, look out um, and predict what might be happening in the future. So uh, being able from a graph to determine the nature of a particular pattern, is it linear or is it non-linear? And even then being able to go a step further and being able to put, um, as Mike was looking at in some of his problems, sort of a functional or an algebraic structure on a visual pattern that you see. So, for example, being able to represent maybe what looks like a linear pattern of points with a suitable line, being able then to get the equation of that line and then maybe being able to use the equation of that line rather than the graph of the line itself to try to uh, make some predictions as to what a record might be, uh, you know, 60, 70 years from now. So um, the problem again, and the, the four graphs are presented on the screen there, and I know now we're about or just over the halfway point of the webinar. So just to break things up a little bit, um, if you feel up, up to it, um, would you mind posting in some answers? Um, and Connor uh, is going to read out some of those answers for the different records mm. that you see there. So if we were to start, for example, with the top left graph, um, what uh, record do you think um, you see changes in? What Olympic record do you think you see changes in in that particular graph? And Connor, feel free to come in now with any of the responses that are coming in. OK, we have one technical query where one person says that they can only see Mike's screen and not Jim's, but I can see yours, Jim, so that might be just a technical glitch with Nicola. OK, uh, 100 metres, says David. 
Anyone so, else? Any other takers? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very good. I'm moving on to. I'll just keep a note of these, and I'm going. I'll go through. I'll go through them all in 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 the next uh, number of slides. The the second graph then would be the top right graph. So, looking at the top gra right graph, looking at the the scaling on each axis, particularly the vertical axis, but also the sort of unusual pattern of points. What summer Olympic event do we think that that is? And again, we're looking here at how the Olympic record in that event is changing over time. Just waiting. Can we wait for <laughs> yeah, the time this is being? the tough one. Yeah. Any guesses? Decathlon, says Paddy. Yeah. OK, decathlon. OK, very good. OK, we'll move on. And the bottom left then. So again, bottom left, uh, what record do we think is being uh, represented there? Nothing yet. I should say, just to put a little bit of um, uh, relaxed pressure on everybody, I, I did give this task to my second years uh, two days ago, so I'm going to report back to you in a minute on what their uh, thinking of about, about these records was and what their thought processes were. So um, we could have a teachers versus students final score here. So we've got two okay. two in so far that could be correct. Do we have a any any takers for the the bottom left? I think we've stumped them, Jim. And that's a pass. OK, and we'll move on then to the bottom right then. So any ideas? About oh, hang the on. We've got right? we've got one uh, one guess for the third one. Long jump. OK, and Pole then vault. bottom, 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 bottom uh, right then. Bottom right. Any. Any suggestions from. The audience. Well, we'll move on and looking we can at. come back to it, I suppose. So uh, looking at the, the graphs then. So the the first graph uh, represents the changes in the Olympic records in the men's 100 metres. So I suppose that's one to the students and one to the teachers this evening. Um, now, of the groups that I had in my second year class looking at this the other day, they were working in groups of two or three. So all nine of the nine groups within a 10 minute period on looking at all four graphs correctly identified this graph. What they reported on was the idea that they saw a downward trend when they were looking at uh, the, the graph. So they reckoned the vertical axis was probably in time units. And given the values on the vertical axis, those units were probably seconds. And a lot of the students had a knowledge, not of Usain Bolt's Olympic record, which I think is 9.63 seconds over 100 metres, but they had a very good knowledge of his world record at 9.58. And they could see that that tallied quite closely with uh, the two most recent Olympic records. The second graph was uh, the men's decathlon. So again, it's a 2-2 now, students, teachers, and um, in the group that I had, only one of the nine groups were able to identify this. So this caused a lot of issues because there's a downward trend, but there's also an upward trend. So there's a mixture of trends. So students discussed how the downward trend implied that the vertical axis was probably in time units, but then the upward trend implied that uh, it was probably in distance units. And this caused a lot of confusion. Now, two groups, uh, I thought very interestingly, had a guess that it might be the men's long jump uh, record that was being represented because they Googled uh, during the lesson what the current men's world record was at 8.92 metres. So then they referred to the vertical axis and they thought that they could see 8.2 metres represented um, on that vertical axis for one are, 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 are both of the most recent Olympic records that you see in the chart. One of these groups uh, thought that the vertical axis was in millimetres, which I suppose would be quite close to 8.92 metres, but the other group thought that it was in centimetres. And we had a discussion then about how they, they, their conversion there to centimetres would have been incorrect, that it would have been obviously a very long, long jump uh, of almost 90 metres if that were the case. Um, now, the correct group thought that the vertical axis probably wasn't either in uh, time units or in distance units, but that it was in something else. And they thought, OK, it must be in points scored. So they thought it might be a gymnastics event or the men's decathlon. And they settled on the decathlon. And at that stage, then in an open class discussion, we we we, we looked at the question as to why 
the record went down and then up and down and then up several times over the last 100 years. And the students collectively were able to come up with the correct response, which is that the point scoring system in that particular event changed many times. So obviously after the point scoring system changes, the previous record is redundant and whatever the, the record, uh, whatever the winning score at the next Summer Olympics is, it uh, becomes the new record. The third graph, um, again, I think we had a response there of the long jump and it was the men's long jump. Um, four of the nine groups got this correct and one of the groups thought it was the women's long jump. So they were able to correctly identify that low and increasing vertical numbers probably meant that it was an event involving distance or height. Um, a few of the students in the class had a prior knowledge that the current women's world record in the event is about seven and a half metres. So they thought, therefore, it's probably the men's uh, event. Once one group actually Googled during the lesson what Olympic records had not been broken since 1968. So they read uh, uh, off the horizontal axis that the last event at uh, the last time this uh, record was set was back in 1968. And from that research, they were able to deduce that it was the men's long jump. And then, so it's 3-3, three, three, I think, now to the uh, teachers versus the students, but the, the, the students just pull ahead with this last one because um, they uh, answered, or some of them did correctly answer, that this event was the women's high jump. So almost all the groups in the class uh, ended up getting that correct. And again, the reason that was given generally was that the vertical axis is probably in metres and some online research of Olympic records that had been set back into and four um, showed for some groups that this was the, the women's uh, high, high jump. Sorry. So um, a link, uh, let's look then at a link to some maybe recent exam questions where this problem and the skills that have been developed in the problem might be you know, put into practice in an exam situation. So we have a question here from the army level uh, paper uh, last year, question four, where students are asked to calculate a percentage increase in a quantity over time. We have another question from the previous year, uh, 2022, uh, the question for in that year where students are presented with a, a trend graph of data and they have to interpret that graph and make sense of it. And we have also a question from the official uh, State Examinations Commission sample paper that I think was published back in 2020 um, for this new junior cycle ordinary level exam. And the question seven in that particular uh, paper presents students with a variety of different graphs and a context, and they have to match the one of the graphs to the context that is described, and they have to give a justification as to why they why they did that. So moving on then to the second uh, problem, and this is the final problem of the webinar this evening. Uh, the, this problem I took from the Purple Comet MathMeet uh, website. So Purple Comet is, as uh, some of you I'm sure know, an online maths competition that's organised in North America, but is open to schools internationally. Um, and it's held every April. So the next edition of the competition is coming up in the first week back after our Easter holidays. There are two versions of the competition, one for middle school students, so that would include first and second years in our system, and one for high school students. And um, it's a great website because there's loads of free and very interesting from easy to very challenging problems um, that would be suitable, not just at junior cycle or ordinary level, but right up to leaving our higher level. So this problem is all about calculating the shaded area that's presented in a diagram. So students are presented with a square within a square and they're told that both squares have integer side lengths and that the region inside the larger square but outside the smaller square, so in this case the shaded area that is seen there, is 52. And they have to work out what the area of the larger square is. So again, looking at some of the possible skills that students would need to be familiar with and that they would be working on and consolidating within this problem. One, I suppose, obviously would be being able to calculate the area of squares and other rectangles. And you can see a worked example from a chapter in the uh, next edition of Active Maths 1 dealing with that. Being able to operate on natural numbers and integers, in particular being able to multiply and being able to uh, subtract uh, integers and in this case, natural numbers. 
Um, being able to use input output tables. Um, and as we'll see in a moment, one of the strategies that students might engage with in this problem would be that sort of more systematic approach rather than relying on trial and improvement where using suitable tables, they're able to come up with a variety of different scenarios and then spot which scenario is the one that leads to the solution for this particular problem. Being able to factorise, um, including being able to factorise the difference of two squares. And we can see here in the slide some text from the upcoming chapter 31 in Active Maths 1, where difference of two squares is introduced and is explained not in the very abstract uh, way in which it's often only presented in an exam situation, but in a diagrammatic way, which is more tangible to students and which lends itself very nicely and in fact to the uh, solving of the problem that we're looking at at the moment. Um, being able to solve simultaneous linear equations. Now that mightn't seem like a skill that's actually required initially to deal with the problem that we're looking at here, but as we'll see, one of the problem solving strategies that students might engage with um, even at junior cycle ordinary level with this problem would require a use of being able to solve uh, simultaneous linear equations and being able to plot the graph of a quadratic function. And we'll see in a moment how that is another skill that could be useful in trying to come up with a solution for this problem. So looking then at different possible uh, problem solving strategies that students might engage in to deal with um, coming up with a solution to this problem. So I suppose one of the more immediate strategies that students might go to would be to maybe using gridded paper and trial and improvement, come up with an initial guess as to what the uh, side length of the larger square and the side length of the smaller square is that would give that difference in area of 52. So in the top right corner there, if we were to guess that the larger square was an eight by eight and the smaller square was a four by four, then the difference in area would be 48. So a second, maybe slightly improved guess might be to at least expand the length of the larger square. So in the bottom right corner, we see a second attempt looking at a nine by nine square and then inside it a five by five square. That leads a difference of 56 uh, units. So again, uh, in terms of area, again, students would perhaps continue uh, and after a certain number of uh, attempts or iterations would arrive at a solution. Another approach that might be taken would be the approach of um, using systematic listing and making use of input output tables. So here what students might do is they might um, come up with an initial input output table, as you see there in the top right of the screen, where X represents the uh, side length in the larger square. And then the second column in that table looks at what X squared is, or the area of that larger square. So uh, they look at a variety of different scenarios, but sort of in the context of working out the output of a function for different input values. And then in a second input output table, and you see that in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, they would have an initial column of Y values, where Y here would be the side length in the shorter square. They could then for each of those Y values work out what the area of that square is or what Y squared is. And then in a third column, they could found, find the output, if you like, of this function, which would be not what y squared is, but what is y squared plus 52, because we really do want to be able to match up an output from the first table with an output from the second table. And to do that most easily, uh, it's better to compare y squared plus 52 with x squared rather than compare uh, x squared with y squared. If you compare x squared y squared, you've got to do the difference of 52 over and over again, and visually that might be uh, more difficult to do. So highlighted in yellow, we can clearly see that if we have a square that's 14 units in length, that's the larger square, and a, a smaller square that has a side length of 12, well then we're going to get this difference in area of 52. So the area of the larger square then must be 14 squared or 196. So moving on then to another approach that students might take, um, they might take an algebraic approach. And actually, one of the interesting things I, I thought in, in, in looking at this problem in some detail was even with the, uh, the, the skills that are developed throughout a book like Active Maths 1, which is for junior cycle ordinary level students, 
there is still the ability for um, extended or more complicated problem solving strategies that make use of those skills. And I suppose it is important to for us all to realise also that in a lot of uh, school situations, students begin their study of maths in first year and even well into second year together um, and be that uh, the, the case that they're going to go on ultimately to take the ordinary level exam or to take the higher level exam. So having a textbook or a resource that is primarily there for junior cycle ordinary level students but that does also allow for the development of skills and the extension in class of activities that cater to a variety of different interests and abilities of students um, is, is a great thing to have. So how would difference of two squares actually be useful in this particular problem? Well, I suppose algebraically what the students are trying to solve is the equation x squared minus y squared is 52, where x squared is the area of the larger square and y squared is the area of the smaller square. Now, if they write that equation in factorized form, they are trying to solve the equation x minus y by x plus y is 52. But if you go back, and I might even just flick back here a few slides to the fourth skill that was referenced for this particular problem. When you consider graphically a difference of two squares, you can actually uh, rearrange the diagram so that the uh, area that you are calculating in that difference um, is represented in a different way. So, for example, if you look at the numerical problem of five squared minus two squared, um, you can see there that the area that we're trying to calculate is the orange shaded area within the five by five square. So you remove the white two by two area and you're left with the remaining orange area. But that orange area can actually be rearranged and you can see it rearranged below as a rectangle, a seven by three rectangle, or in other words, a five plus two by a five minus two rectangle. So with that in mind, students uh, could be, now they might well need a little bit of support and prompting to get there, and not all students, of course, would be using this strategy, but some students could use this strategy where they would recognize that they're trying to solve the equation X minus Y by X plus Y is 52. But remembering in the problem that X is an integer and that Y is an integer, well, then X minus Y has to be an integer and X plus Y also has to be an integer. And then recognizing that X minus Y and X plus Y are both lengths or widths within that reformed rectangle, students then realize that X minus Y has to be natural and X plus Y has to be natural. So actually what they're being asked to deal with here is to find two natural numbers that multiply to 52, or in other words, to find a factor pair of 52 that is, that's going to give uh, the solution. So possible factor pairs that, pairs that they would have to work with would be 1, 52, 2, 26 or 4, 13. Now, if they choose 1, 52, they then end up with the simultaneous linear system X minus Y is 1, X plus Y is 52. And adding those equations to solve for X, they get a value for X of 26.5. But in this problem, they have to reject that because X, we're told in the question, is an integer. So moving on to the second pair, 226, they'd have to solve simultaneously the equations x minus y is 2 and x plus y is 26. And adding the equations, they'd get the solution there, x is 14, which is the acceptable and the required solution, the integer solution for x. So the square then of the, the area rather of the larger square must be 14 squared, 196. And a fourth and final strategy that again students could make use of would be uh, using their knowledge of being able to graph functions, in this case, quadratic functions. If they were to graph uh, the quadratic function y is x squared, where x is the length of the larger square, they would then be producing a graph for the area of the larger square for different uh, side lengths in that larger square. If on the same diagram, they then graphed uh, y is x minus k by x minus k, where k can take successive natural uh, values, they are in that case then looking at, for a particular value of k, the graph of the area of the smaller square. 
And what they would then be looking for would be, is there having drawn the first graph, y is x squared, and having drawn in a variety of cases, the second graph, y is the square of x minus k, is there ever a vertical distance between those two graphs of 52? Is there a difference in area of 52? And as you can see in the diagram on the right that was generated in GeoGebra, there is a difference of 52 when x is 14. So the larger square would have a side length of 14, so it would have an area of 196. So looking at how some previous and recent exam questions at this level would tie in with the skills and the strategies that have been developed within this problem. Back in 2019 in paper one, question seven at junior cycle ordinary level, the factorization of difference of two squares appeared. And again, I think it's important to point out that usually this type of problem appears in a very abstract sense, but that particular part of the course still lends itself to a very tangible treatment and a very interesting treatment that students can actually explore and really engage in. And a final previous past question at junior cycle ordinary level that again might be linked in with some of the skills and strategies that we saw in that problem would be from the 2017 paper one, question one, where students are given a list of different natural numbers and they're asked to write down all of the factors. So I hope that um, that was in some way useful and I'll hand you back to Connor now, who's going to close off the remainder of the webinar. Thanks very much, Jim, and thanks very much as well, Mike, uh, for such an informative and interactive presentation. Um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, I think Mike mentioned earlier that, um, that there's sometimes a bit of a struggle or a challenge involved in these type of tasks or in developing problem solving skills. But what I got from that, at least, or what I could, could glean was that um, that's where a lot of the understanding and um, the, the skill development happens. So um, that was very insightful and thanks very much for this. I just wanted to quickly mention to everyone, because I'm conscious of time, that um, this webinar coincides with the publication of our brand new Active Maths 1 teaching package. So that's the third edition. And um, the book has been completely um, re revised, I suppose, to bring it more in line with the requirements of the um, of the exam and I guess just the common level course in general and how it's taught in classrooms now um, some years after the specification was first published in 2018. So there's lots of new features in that we've um, if you're familiar with the Active Maths 3 third edition we have colour coded um, question difficulty levels in every exercise which helps to identify difficulty at a glance and helps to support differentiation if you need to with your class. Um, we've also got new linking learning sections which tie a lot of the topics together and include lots of problem solving type questions um, which also serve as exam practice for your students and there's also then um, a CBA reference chapter which you can use um, as, as the teacher, but also to help your students prepare both for the mathematical investigation and the statistical investigation CBA. So to the next slide, so, and I think Karan has just added some info. He's added a link into chat if you want to take a closer look at what we have available on folins.ie and take a look at the teaching package. You can look at the, 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 the book and the digital resources that we have available with that. Um, and on to the next slide. Jim, if you click forward for me there. Um, if you need to contact or if you if you have more interest or any questions about Active Maths and you'd like to contact your local Follins rep, you can do that um, by going to the link. There's um, a link that's been added there to chat. And if you go onto Follins.ie and enter your school name or your role number, that will return then your con the, your your local reps contact details and you can get in touch with them and they can support you um, with that information. They're very knowledgeable bunch. Um, so then just moving then to the last slot or the last section of the webinar, if anyone would like to add some more questions there, I'll take a look at the chat now in a minute. But a couple of questions just to put to either Mike or to Jim to kick things off. Firstly, how frequently would you use these problem solving exercises um, in your ordinary level classroom? Uh, thanks, Connor. Yeah, um, I think it depends really on the 
on the on the class group that you have in front of you and also how comfortable, how familiar you are. I don't think any teacher should feel under any pressure or obligation to be doing something that they're unfamiliar with, that they're uncomfortable with. Um, if it's something you're interested in introducing, I think it's best to do that at a pace that suits you. Um, we all know that, you know, there's no one junior cycle order and level class that's the same as any other. So I think every teacher is best placed themselves to judge the frequency that would be most suitable for them. And perhaps, yes, yeah, something that could be looked at uh, would be maybe trying to have one or two of these tasks introduced on a maybe a three weekly or a, or a monthly basis. But I think it all depends mainly on the, the group of students that you have in front of you and how comfortable you feel yourself. I don't think that it's something that um, any teacher should feel under uh, an obligation or a pressure to do. I mean, at the end of the day, we do know our students best, I think, as teachers. We do we do have a feel because we're with them for several hours every day as to what they need. And, you know, maybe loads of problem solving is what some groups need and maybe very little is what other groups need. Thanks, Jim. Um, another one, just where can we source more of these types of problem solving questions? Jim, I'll let you answer that one as well, because you mentioned uh, Enrich, didn't you, earlier on? Um, in actual fact, I get, got one or two of the of the questions from, from that particular site, but you seem to have more knowledge of, of that, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, like, I, in my experience, I, I have found that my colleagues are the best, like, resource to get resources. Um, um, you could spend a long time looking online for, for suitable resources and uh, a colleague might have two or three really good resources that they've been using for years. So there's a website, for example, called Transum, T-R-A-N-S-U-M dot org, I think is their web address. Um, I'm not sure where it's based. It, it looks like it's North American and it has loads of um, web based and online interactive and self-correcting um tasks that are really suitable for junior cycle ordinary level um, and i make a little bit of use in that with with my junior cycle ordinary level and junior cycle higher level classes as well and particularly now because in our school we're in this process of sort of moving towards um students uh, having devices for textbooks rather than physical textbooks so they have this technology that they can make use of in class um, but it's a website that I had never heard of. It's been around for a really long time. And it was only a few years ago, I was just in you know, the class of a colleague one day. Um, I think I just called in to ask for uh, some information about something entirely unrelated. And I could see all of these students working away in this website. I was like, what is that website? You know. So I think like there's a lot of wealth of information within each of our schools. I mean, probably I would say no one listening here this evening who is a maths teacher is the only maths teacher in their school or is the only maths teacher at junior cycle within their school. So because we we teach maths, we're quite fortunate, I think, you know, we work with, you know, several other teachers, maybe a la very large number of other teachers of the same subject. So I think reach out to colleagues in school and, you know, over time you pick up uh, you know, really nice uh, tidbits or whatever of information and good resources. I mean, if you pick up one good resource a year, you're you're laughing. Jim, just could you clarify? We've got a question in. Um, just could you clarify the name of that American website again? Oh yeah, so I don't know if it's North American, but I, I, I it has a look uh, of it. Uh, it looks like it is. So it's Transom a T R A N S U M um, dot org. So it's um it's really really useful and um, yep completely freely available and um, uh, one of the great aspects of it actually is that it has loads of uh, activities that students can do there in front of you in class. So even if they don't have a device like an iPad or a Surface Pro or something, and, and you're willing, they can they can access it and use it on their phone. Um, and you know a lot of drill exercises. Um, now that may be something we're not <laughs> meant to steer clear of, but you know if you're d teaching, for example, factorizing highest common factor, factorizing difference of two squares, factorizing a quadratic trinomial, loads of leveled activities from easier to medium, uh, with plenty of scaffolding. Um, and one of the great things I find is that when you give the same types of question in a textbook, 
uh, students, they're not getting any feedback there and then as they do the question. They have to wait for you or they have to wait for other students to get feedback, but they get feedback on this website immediately. They can check their answers if they're wrong, they know they're wrong, they can go back to them. They get that sense of satisfaction of, you know, proceeding from one level to the next and to the next. You can set the, the work as homework as well and ask them to take a screenshot of their completed work where, you know, the correct ticks would, would need to be beside all of the questions before they submit it, something like that. So yeah, T-R-A-N-S-U-M dot org is the address. Right. And we've just posted it to the chat to, there as well for everybody. Sorry, Mike. Yeah, just one other thing I suppose to add, uh, add to that is that when you do access these uh, problems online or whatever, do you know that it, I think it's important to, to, to go through the problem and to tailor to meet the needs of, of your own students as well. I know the problems that we've looked at there this evening, um, two of them I got off that Enrich uh, site, but there was a lot of scaffolding and work to be done with the, the problem before I had it ready to to present it and I'm pretty sure that would be the same with, with, with our own students. Um, you get great ideas um, but then it's important I suppose not to just go in and to present that problem as it appeared on the website to the student that you have actually done a bit of work on it and scaffolded properly to meet the, the needs of the whole spectrum of, of students that are in front of you. Thanks Mike. So I think that takes us to the end of the webinar again jim and mike thanks so much for um such a great presentation and um, it's really appreciated there's lots of thanks coming through in the chat so i hope that the people who are attending and um, this evening it seems that they've gotten something from it um to the teachers to everyone um who's joined us this evening um we appreciate that it's a very busy time of the year particularly if you're if you're teaching leaving cert and all the different things I suppose that converge at this time of year so to give us an hour or so of your evening is very much appreciated and it seems that you've gotten something from it so it's great to see that um so really from that's it I think I think from from Jim from Mike and myself thanks again for joining us and I hope to see you again at our next webinar <laughs>